Hey, Math 43, welcome to the Chapter 7 Summary Keynote. And here we're looking at sampling distributions. And when you hear this word, oops, excuse me, distribution, right, we're talking about graphs. Uh, sometimes we talk about tables. That was back in Chapter 4 when we had a discrete numerical variable, but we're talking about graphs here. Um, we've been talking about graphs. Why can't I get that right parentheses to go? My pen's not quite working up there. There we go. Um, we, we're talking about graphs. Oh, like I said, in chapter four, we talked about tables, but chapters five, six, and seven, it's all about the graph. Now, we've been in two lands here. We've been in mean land, and we've been in proportion land. So whenever you have a numerical variable, right, and it means your variable is either discrete or continuous, but it's got some units, and you're looking at averages, um, you're going to be in mean land. When you have a categorical variable, what you're going to do is you're going to take that frequency count, whatever you're calling a success, the number of successes, you're going to divide by sample size and get a proportion. And things that we're interested in for both distributions, whether you're in mean land or proportion land, is we always want to know the center, right, which we call the mean. We want to know the standard deviation, which when you're on the sampling distribution side of things, you've heard me talk about that phrase standard error. All right, we want to find out, hey, can I put that capital N on the shape of my sampling distribution because when I can put the N there, I get to use normal CDF. And if I can put the N there and use normal CDF, I can calculate probabilities. Keeping in mind that there are gonna be problems in chapter seven and then eight and nine as well, where if that normality assumption isn't met, if that's not met, then I can't calculate probabilities. So there are times when, when you have to actually stop the problem and say, hey, I can't go further. Now let's focus on mean land, all right? So the first thing we're going to do is going to, we're going to look at what happens when you graph an average, right? What's its shape, what's its center, and what's its spread. So of socks, right, this is actually three of them right here, shape, center, and spread. Now, like I said, we're going to call that standard error. We're going to talk about how you're or when you're allowed to put that capital N, and then we're going we're gonna to calculate some probabilities with this. All right, so thinking about mean land, right, imagine you had a population and you took sample after sample after sample after sample, and you kept track of the mean. So you got an X bar from here, an X bar from here, an X bar from here, an X bar from here. Well, you can imagine if you repeated your samples, and again, you took sample after sample after sample, and crunched number after number after number, those numbers being the means, you would not get the same X bar each time, right? This X bar would have a different value than this X bar. I mean, theoretically, they could be the same, but it's pretty um, unlikely. So imagine I repeated this, right? I resampled and I replaced as many times as you want. And you can keep track of a mean or a median. We're usually keeping track of the mean. And imagine that you had all these teeny little X bars at the end. Imagine you had a thousand of them. In, in the actual chapter for chapter seven, I, I simulated doing that 500 times out using um, some, a computer program. But if I repeated that process, right, again, we won't always have the same sample. So we won't always get the same number for our statistics. And that, that idea right there is called sampling variability. Quite literally, samples vary. And because they vary, because that is a word, they, that means they have their own graph, right, an X bar graph and it's got its own set of socks. All right, so, ooh, let me get rid of the, the, let me erase all this. There are some fun scribbles on that that goes with the other slide. So imagine again that I got X bar after X bar after X bar, and I started to graph all of them, right? I'm graphing X bars here, keeping in mind if I had a Y axis labeled, it would be the probability of X bar. All right, but it's got its own distribution. It's got its own graph, and there's some rules that it follows, and we're gonna look at those rules. So imagine I had a population distribution, right? And I'm telling you, the population distribution, it is normally distributed, so let's keep that in mind. We're already starting with a capital N. 100 is under the peak, and I, I can spread that out with a standard deviation of five. So you can see the shape here, right? It's approximately normal, all right? You can see 100 is under the peak, and then you can see it's a reasonable guess to have a standard deviation of five. All right. So moving through there, I want us to imagine what would happen if I started to take samples and graphed the sample means, right? So when you hear sampling distribution, I am graphing an average. All right, so just to compare and contrast, if I was gonna label axes here, this would be an X. All four of these are gonna be X bars. 
All right. So let's start to look at these, these different histograms. Now, this is when I took samples of size 5, 10, 20, and 30. Right, so the thing that's changing in these four graphs, these four sampling distributions, is the sample size. So things I want us to take note of, look, 100 is under the peak, 100 is under the peak, 100 is under the peak, 100 is under, under the peak. Right, let me change colors here so we can kind of look at this. Approximately normal, approximately normal, approximately normal, approximately normal. I think if you take a step back and look at those four histograms, the thing that you start to notice is that the spread's getting smaller, right? So if I look at that, right, initially, well, actually, let me go back to initially, you can see the spread there, and then now start to look at that thing getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then ee, super small, right? So we have some rules that, oops, sorry, we have some rules that govern us. So you see here that the sampling distribution, I get to pick up the N, this capital N for the shape, because my population distribution was normally distributed. So if your population distribution starts with a capital N, you automatically get the N here, all right? So the center stayed the same, it was 100. And then the standard error gets governed by this formula, five over the square root of N, all right? So taking a look at this, again, if the population distribution is approximately normal, then the sampling distribution for means will also be approximately normal regardless of the sample size. So because I could put this N here, I can use normal CDF anytime I want. So there wouldn't be a problem or a probability that I couldn't calculate if this were my population distribution. All right, so now let's counter that. Let's say I started with a population distribution, and you can see it here, it's slightly skewed left, right? Or I'll just say skewed left. 110 is under the peak, and it's got a standard deviation of 10. Now here, if you look at this, I took, I, I'm graphing samples now, right? I took samples of size five and graphed their averages, and samples of size 10 and graphed their averages. So again, if we're thinking of labels, an X bar would go here, an X bar would go here, but an X would go here. All right, so now things to take a look at, 110 still under the peak, 110 still under the peak. Now this is actually getting pretty close to being approximately normal, right? And this is even closer, but we need to see if we can officially say it. So, oops, that went the wrong direction. Excuse me, let me scooch back there. All right, so if we look again now at our sampling distributions, right, our graphs of averages, I, I have that for this first one here. And this is my own notation that this graph is slightly skewed left. That is not technical, but I just it's slightly skewed left, right? You can still see it skews a bit, but definitely not as much as the population. 110 is still under the peak, and the standard error formula is coming from me taking 10 and dividing by the square root of the sample size, which is technically 4.47, right? It's just not a spread out, right? The, the standard deviation was cut by more than half. Now, if I go over to this graph here, all right, again, not technically, but I called it super slightly skewed left. Again, not a technical term, but the mean stayed the same, and the standard error got even smaller. And, and you can see that, right? It's just not as spread out, right? This is much more spread out, and this is way more spread out. So things that we start to notice is that as sample size increases, standard error or standard deviation or variability, whatever um, term you want to use, they all decrease. All right, now, the other thing to keep in mind, if the population distribution is not normal, then the sampling distribution will not necessarily be normal. The way to get the sampling distribution to be normal is if this sample size is 30 or higher. That's when I could change out all these funky notations and just put the N. But, but again, I can't, let me erase that. I can't do that yet because my sample size is not 30. All right, so again, notice that as sample size increases, the centers stay the same and the spreads become smaller. Right? And then on top of that, the shape will get closer and closer to that of a normal curve. So if I have this population distribution here, you can start to see if I graph, and let me make sure I'm being specific. This is the population. Here's a sampling distribution, a sampling distribution, and a sampling distribution. Right? So let's, let's take a look at how this is working out. And actually, let me erase my little um, x-axis real quick because it's blocking things. So I'll put x here, x bar, x bar x bar. So things I want to point out. All right, let's take a look at the center. So the center here, I don't know, it looks somewhere around three, right? But again, somewhere around three, somewhere around three, somewhere around three. If I look at the shape, 
right? This is definitely skewed right. This is slightly skewed right. This is getting to be approximately normal, and this is also approximately normal. And the reason I can put the N here, excuse me, the capital N, I should say, on both of these bottom ones is because the sample size is 30 or higher. And it was actually pretty close here at N equaling 15, but I can't officially say it because of the central limit theorem. And another thing to notice is that the spreads get smaller, right? This looks like it's 0 to 16, then we're at like 0 to 5, then we're maybe at like 1 to 4.5, and, and then it's just getting smaller, right? So as the sample size increases, variability decreases. All right, so now even if I start out with something super, I, I just called this ugly, right? That is multimodal. All right, Ooh, let me not circle it twice. So if I start out with a distribution, that is a population distribution that is really ugly, and imagine I had a sample size of 30, right? And I wanted to graph my X bars, graph my sampling distribution, which of these five options would it be? Well, it would be the one that was down here. And actually, I'm going to erase that because it's, it's going to click in just a sec. So even our ugly shaped population distribution, even with that, the central limit theorem still kicks in and makes the shape of the sampling distribution approximately normal. So it doesn't matter what shape you start with, the CLT will force normality. And we can officially say that at sample sizes of 30 or higher in mean land. Keep in mind, this whole summary keynote so far has been in mean land. And that's part of why the central limit theorem quite literally is so central to statistics. We realized we could get normality if we graphed averages from samples of 30 or si samples of size 30 or higher, and that was a huge deal to us. All right, so let's recap. Sampling distributions for sample means. All right, the mean is the same as the population. So this is saying the mean of your sampling distribution, right? The center of sec x bar is the same as the center of your population. That always stays the same. But the standard error it has a formula, right? So as sample size increases, this ratio will decrease. Now keep in mind, I know it says sampling distribution of, I'm sorry, standard deviation of sampling distribution. That is a mouthful. So when you hear me talk about the sampling error, oh gosh, excuse me, standard error. I, I even messed the words up. Standard error, that is the same thing. Sampling error is something different. All right, how do you get normality in mean land? There are two ways. So if the population distribution is stated to be normal, then your sample size can be anything. But if you don't know your population distribution's shape, or you were told it was skewed right or left, then you, you need the sample size to be 30 or higher for the central limit theorem to kick in. All right, and I'm gonna give you a little heads up. I know right now we have two ways. Once we get to chapter eight, there's gonna be a third way to get normality in mean land. All right, now if I get to put that my sampling distribution is approximately normal, I can calculate some probabilities using normal CDF, all right? And if I can't, then I, I will just simply state like, hey, I can't, I can't do this calculation. All right, so some advice, especially now that we're in chapter seven, moving into chapter eight and nine, you're gonna hear me talk about checking your normality assumptions. Do it, like right out the gate. Check that normality is met. And in mean land specifically, that means that either your population distribution was stated to be normal or the central limit theorem has kicked in. And in mean land, that is N being greater than 30. All right, and I wanna stress that this is just the mean land rules. In a couple of slides, we're gonna to get to the proportion land rules and they are different. And you wanna to start to separate those two worlds. All right, so if you get stuck, I always say, ask yourself some questions. What is your variable? That should be how you're starting every problem. And then what do you know about your population distribution? Do you know its shape? Do you know it's center? Do you know it's spread? And just keep track of, do you know those things or do you not know those things? It's one of those where you want to know what you know and also know what you don't know. All right. And then ask yourself, hey, am I being asked about the population or am I being asked to, to take a sample and look at an average? And if you are on a sampling distribution, what is its center, its shape, and its spread? All right. Are one of those graphs normal? Are they both normal? Are neither of them normal? All right. And then the question that you're looking at specifically, are you being asked about the population or the sample sampling distribution, right? You need to know which one are you being asked about because you need to use the correct information. This phrase, right, increasing sample size reduces variability. I've mentioned it a couple times in this keynote. Just make sure you know it for your chapter seven quiz, right? If averages are harder to move, right? The larger 
um, your sample size, the larger your mean is built off of a larger sample, then the harder it is to move that average, and that's why it's not as variable. All right, now let's take a look at all of this again, but let's go through the categorical side of things, proportion land. And I, I mentioned this in the videos, your book doesn't really do the hottest job at um, taking a look at this, but proportion land is definitely going to show up in chapters eight and nine. All right, so we're going to look at, ooh, and I just noticed this says we will focus on sample means. I will fix that. We're going to now focus, wait for it, on sample proportions. My bad. Okay, so we're going to take a look at how to break down these formulas. All right, so when you're looking at sampling distributions for proportions, the mean of the sampling distribution is this is whatever the population proportion is. So whatever your population proportion is, that's where your sampling distribution will be centered, meaning that'll be the number under the peak. When you want to scale the graph, the sampling distribution for a proportion land, you're going to use this formula for your standard error. And I know it's an ugly formula, right? But I'm going to write standard error here. All right, so we will calculate that number. Whatever the square root of P, one minus P over N is equal to, that's what you'll use to scale out your P prime axis. So what I mean by that is if you have a graph, right, and you're graphing P prime, P will be here, and then you will add a standard error, add a standard error, add a standard error, subtract a standard error, subtract a standard error, subtract a standard error. If we think about the Z scores, the Z scores, like always, would be this. All right, now, Normality, there are three things that have to happen in proportion land, and they all have to happen. All right, you need at least 10 successes, right? That's what this is talking about. So I'll write this in words. At least 10 successes in your sample, whatever is deemed a success, and that'll come in the context of your problem. You need at least 10 failures in your sample as well. All right, and that's... The second thing, and if either of those fail, these two are by far the most important. If either of these two fail, you stop the problem. You're also going to need your sample size to be small relative to your population. And we have that that sample size has to be less than 10% of your population size. And sometimes they use capital N to represent your population size. This allows us to sample without replacement. So technically, let me write replacement. If, if we're doing true sampling, you should sample with replacement so that the probability of success stays the same each time out. It's just in the real world, we, we don't usually do that. All right, we don't sample somebody or an object and then throw them back into the pool so that they might get selected again. And the rule is if your sample size is less than 10% of your population, you're fine to sample without replacement. All right, so those are the rules that are going to govern how do we get the approximately normal right in proportion land. And then if we can, we're going to calculate some probabilities using normal CDF. All right, now you know I love to make flowcharts. So here's the, the one that I made. So when you're starting these problems and you're starting to prep for midterm two or your final, ask yourself, you should always start with what was my variable? Always, that should be every problem. And then see if it was numerical or categorical. Now, I'm going to start on the categorical side of things, so I'm going to head down here first just because it's not as crowded. If it's categorical and you have a sample, right, you have a categorical variable, and they said we took a random sample of 45 people and asked them, did they like, I don't know, chocolate ice cream or not? If you have a categorical variable and you have a sample, you're definitely going to be on the sampling distribution for proportions. There's just no other option. Now, if it's numerical, you've got way more options. All right, and we've seen all of these play out in chapters four through seven. So if it's numerical, you've got to figure out, well, is it discrete or continuous? Now, let's say it's discrete. Let's go up the, the topmost part of this tree diagram. If it's discrete, you've got to say, well, was this a table problem? If it was, was the table given to me or do I need to make it? All right, so there's sometimes when it's a discrete numerical variable and it's a table problem and you've got to write that sample space in the top row and probabilities in the bottom row. It's nice when the table's given to you, but sometimes you have to make it. And then there's times when you have to remember, hey, is this a binomial experiment? Right? You've got to check through those four properties. And if it is a binomial experiment, you can just draw me the squiggles. Right? X is approximately binomial distributed, N and P. And you get to save yourself making a table. Now let's go down to the continuous side of things. There's a lot of options. So you might have had a uniform distribution. You might have been on the standard normal curve. You might have been on the regular normal curve, 
And again, if there was a sample involved, you would have been on the sampling distribution for means, right? So things to compare and contrast, and let me use a different color here as I go through this. Let me erase what I have. All right, so um, what's a good one? I don't think I've really used, well, we'll do blue. All right, so anytime you have a sample, you're either going to you're going to be on one of our sampling distributions and it really comes down to did you have a numerical variable and you're looking at means or did you have a categorical variable and you're looking at proportions and again that's when you're on a sample if you don't have a sample then you're going to be one on, potentially on one of these other ones all right there are times when you'll have a sample you'll hear about a fixed number of trials and you'll say well okay am i in this binomial experiment here or am i down on the um, sampling distribution for proportions and it comes down to are you looking at a proportion are you looking at a relative frequency or in the binomials you're actually looking at the frequency so here you're looking at number of successes right a frequency and here you're looking at the proportion of successes a relative frequency so they're definitely related and it all comes down to are you looking at the frequency or the relative frequency? All right, thanks so much. I know that was a long one. I'll see you later. Bye.